All right, so yeah, I'm Maddie Howell. I'm a PhD student at Monash University. And today I'll be talking about how we can use astroseismology to measure an integrated mass loss of evolved stars in the globular cluster M4. So I wanted to start off uh, today uh, by discussing the significance of stellar mass loss. So when I'm referring to stellar mass loss, I'm talking about the process where stellar matter is being transported away from the surface of the star. And this happens throughout the entirety of the star's lifetime. But for low mass stars, which is what I was focusing on, mass loss is most significant on the red giant branch. And this will have impacts on the subsequent evolutionary phases and also on the final stellar remnant. And one thing I did want to emphasize is that mass loss rates remain a major uncertainty in stellar models. And this obviously impacts any study that uses stellar models, but it also impacts other astronomical fields, such as galactic chemical evolution and also population synthesis. So we really need to derive accurate mass loss rates that we can implement into our stellar models. And the first step to do this is to measure the total amount of matter lost for low mass stars during the RGB phase. And one of the best objects to do this are globular clusters. So a globular cluster is a really old uh, gravitationally bound stellar grouping. And due to their old age, it means that all the stars are all low metallicity and low mass. And they're also in a variety of evolutionary stages. And this makes globular clusters the perfect objects to study stellar evolution. So from previous studies, we know that there is a estimated RGB mass loss of about 0.2 solar masses. And I use this value as a consistency check in my study. So I was looking at the globular cluster M4, which is the closest globular cluster to Earth. And it has all those typical properties of being old and metal poor. And we know from isochrome fitting that the stars have an initial mass of about 0.8 solar masses. So to measure an integrated RGB mass loss, we need to find the mass difference between the start of the red giant branch and also the horizontal branch. And one of the best ways to, uh, to estimate accurate masses is using astroseismology. So astroseismology is the detection of waves that propagate within a star. I was looking at the solar-like oscillations. And these are pressure mode or acoustic waves that oscillate in the convective envelopes of stars. And we measure these solar-like oscillations from the power spectra of either spectroscopic or photometric light curves. And they appear as these comb-like Gaussian-shaped structures. And I show an example of a solar-like oscillation for a main sequence star on that bottom left plot. So from the solar-like oscillations, we can measure two global astroseismic parameters. The first one is new max, and this is the frequency of the maximum acoustic power. And the second one is delta nu, which is the large frequency difference between signal peaks of the same spherical harmonic mode. So these two seismic parameters are related to stellar properties. So new max is related to the surface gravity and the temperature, and delta nu is related to the average density of the star. And from those two relations, and also the stefan boltzmann luminosity law, we can derive four seismic mass equations. I've got those up on the screen. And these relations are in terms of new max, delta nu, temperature, and luminosity. So within my study, I took photometric data from Kepler, the Kepler telescope's second mission, which is K2, and half of M4 was observed during campaign two for roughly 80 days. So unfortunately, there was some disadvantages to the K2 telescope, which doesn't make it optimal for studying globular clusters. So the first one is there is an inherent roll noise in the second mission, so only in the K2 mission. And basically there was a telescope drift and the telescope would drift for one pixel and then get a correction. And this happened every six hours, so it was periodic. And it's something you have to detrend out of your photometry. Another disadvantage of the telescope was that the telescope had large pixel sizes of roughly four arc seconds per pixel. And this makes it really hard to distinguish between uh, stars that are really close. So this is especially important in the cluster centre. So you can really only study the outer um, or the outskirts of the clusters. 
And finally, the K2 mission or the campaigns the K2 mission had short observed preserving periods of roughly 80 days. And this is not optimal um, for there'll be a cluster of stars, you really need longer observations to actually resolve the signals. Uh, and once I took the power spectra of my final light curves, we realized that there was low signal to noise of our solar-like oscillations. And ultimately, this will affect the measurement of that delta nu parameter. So delta nu is that frequency difference between peaks. And if we can't differentiate between signal peaks and noise peaks, then we can't accurately measure this parameter. So despite all these limitations, we were still able to detect solar-like oscillations in 75 evolved stars across the evolutionary phases of the red giant branch, the red horizontal branch, and the early asymptotic giant branch phases. And this is the largest astroseismic analysis of globular cluster stars to date. So there's only been two other seismic studies also on M4. And our sample really is a uh, significant increase from those past two studies. So another um, cool outcome of our study is we have the first detections of solar oscillations in early asymptotic giant branch stars. Oh, and I show my sample in a Gaia color magnitude diagram there on the right as well. So onto the mass loss results. So once I had found the new max delta nu temperature and luminosity for all my stars, I computed the individual masses and then for each evolutionary phase took the average from those four equations. And I show a summary of my results on that left plot. So what is commonly done in astroseismology is to use delta nu corrections. And that's because we know there is deviations from the delta nu density relation that I talked about earlier. So what we do is we uh, compute delta nu corrections from models, and then they're implemented into the mass relations. So on that left plot, the red uh, points are my uncorrected masses, and then the black points are the corrected masses. And one thing to note is you only do the delta nu corrections for the relations that are dependent on delta nu. So the third equation is independent, so there is no corrections being done there. So if you again draw your eyes to equation three, you can see that it has the smallest uncertainties out of all those, uh, out of the four relations. Where the uncertainty here is the standard error on the mean. We also compare all these uh, mass averages to a model predicted mass, and that's indicated by the gray horizontal line. And again, for equation three in the red giant branch phase and the red horizontal branch phase, the masses are remarkably similar to that predicted mass. So due to these reasons, and also the fact that equation three is independent of that delta nu parameter, which I've already highlighted as um, quite an inaccurate parameter in my study, we concluded that the equation three masses were the most reliable or are the most accurate in the study. So my final mass loss result is using those equation three masses. And one other thing I wanted to point out is the early asymptotic giant branch mass. So if you look at the third panel and again look at equation three, you'll see that the mass that we determined is significantly lower than the prediction from the standard model. It's actually about the same mass as predicted for the white dwarfs for this cluster of about 0.5 solar masses. <laughs> so we currently think this is either due to unknown systematics in the mass relations or um, larger than expected horizontal branch mass loss. So here is my summary slide. Um, so the first three points is just summing up what I found in my study. So largest ever astroseismic with analysis of globular cluster stars and the first detections of solar -like oscillations in early asymptotic giant branch stars. And one thing I forgot to mention is that we did work out an accurate integrated mass loss on the red giant branch using the average mass for the red giant branch and the red horizontal branch. And we found a mass loss of 0.17 plus or minus 0.01 solar masses. And this is similar to that 0.2 solar mass mass loss that I mentioned earlier that was expected for globular clusters. So I also wanted to quickly point out some other science opportunities of using H2 data with globular clusters. So we obviously looked at stellar mass loss in this study, but you can also look at multiple populations in globular clusters, non-standard evolutionary stars, and also variable stars. And finally, we really need a space-based photometric mission to observe globular clusters for longer amounts of time. So we can improve on studies like mine 
And this is advocated by the Science Collaboration Hayden. Thank you for listening.